A lost history has recently come to light. The story of the Chinese who pioneered America's Old West. Thousands would help build one of the most daunting enterprises ever attempted. The Transcontinental Railroad. They would risk their lives in a bid to conquer the steep Sierra Mountains. Their heroic efforts would make history on Gold Mountain. In the mid-1800s, America's Wild West is rough, dangerous, and full of opportunity. For nearly a decade, pioneering Chinese have been seeking their fortunes on Gold Mountain and returning home with tales of adventure. My grandfather told me that when he was a, a young boy, he'd hear stories of Gumsan. He would talk about how wonderful and exciting America was. Great grandfather, he was probably surprised to learn that America was tough. It was a tough place to work. It was wild country, and it had everything that he'd never seen before. Thousands of Chinese would become an integral part of America's West, building the first transcontinental railroad that would stretch nearly 2,000 miles across the country. Among them is Connie Young Yu's great grandfather, Lee Wong Sang. Lee Wong Sang was uh, the railroad worker. He came in 1866 during the height of hiring by the Central Pacific. He was uh, hired by a contractor, also named Lee, who worked with the contractors in America. Li Wang Sang is welcomed by a family association, which organizes housing, food, and work for newcomers. There's already a store that my great-grandfather could go to and say, you know, I'm, I'm your relative from the village, and he'd be taken in. District associations were responsible for taking care of him, so I think he was, he felt there was a welcome. He was 19 years old, and he came to work on the railroad, and he must have had tremendous experiences. And because of the railroad, our family had its first foothold in America. By mid-1865, Connie's great-grandfather would be among 4,000 young men recruited from China to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. Their heroic efforts would be crucial to this monumental undertaking. <laughs> 
he set sail with his uncles to America. They were promised vegetables, dried octopus, dried squid, dried fish, salted, and a whole bowl of rice. It was $25 a month. He could even send money home. Men had to leave in order for their families to survive. There's an old saying in the southern villages, if you go overseas, you might drown. But if you stay home, most assuredly, you will starve. Halfway around the world, the Irish are also suffering from starvation. They too would risk the long journey to America, desperate to feed their families. Competition for jobs would ultimately set them against the Chinese in a history marked with conflict and violence. The Irish in many ways were to immigration to the eastern part of the United States what the Chinese were to immigration to the western part of the United States. Ireland was suffering from a tremendous famine that started in the 1840s and basically caused a third to half of the population to leave. The influx of Irish and Chinese would prove key to President Abraham Lincoln's dream of building a railroad across the continent. In the early 18th, America is in the throes of a deadly civil war. President Lincoln is determined to strengthen his position by unifying East with West. It was Lincoln's desire to attach California to the United States firmly and permanently. And the only question was, when, how, will the railroad get to California? To get from the Missouri Valley to California, that was going to require some federal money. President Lincoln offers railroad barons huge sums of money and land, creating one of the greatest competitions in modern history. From the east, the Union Pacific would tackle 1,000 miles of wild plains. From the west, the Central Pacific would face 700 miles through the rugged Sierra Nevada mountains and beyond. The railways would meet someplace in Utah. In 1863, both companies break ground, and the race is on. Engineers estimate it will require 5 million railroad ties and more than 600,000 rails, each rail weighing 700 pounds. In total, 21 million hammer strikes. Millions of dollars are at stake. It's a bold and risky undertaking. Many say, impossible. At first, the railroad barons hire only Anglo workers. The Union Pacific recruits plenty of Irish in the East. But in the West, the Central Pacific has a problem. On the West Coast, they weren't sure who to use. They put out a call for workers, but only received about 500 applicants. They knew that they would need at least 5,000. Scalable Sierra Mountains is not for the faint-hearted. When the Central Pacific reaches the back-breaking hard clay and rock of the Sierra foothills, progress grinds to a halt. What happens next will change Chinese and American history forever. The Transcontinental Railroad is at a standstill in the West. In six months, the Central Pacific has laid only 18 miles of track. Ahead, they must determine a route through the steep Sierras. These massive mountains rise 7,500 feet in just 100 miles. Sheer ravines and solid rock verticals 
taught the engineers. Unlike the Union Pacific portion of the Transcontinental Railroad, which was flat, the Central Pacific had to build a road through the Sierra Nevada. Now, who thought of that? Central Pacific Railroad Baron Charles Crocker urges his foreman, James Strobridge, to try using Chinese workers. 后来呢就有人就说Strobridge grudgingly hires some 50 Chinese workers as a test, fully expecting failure. 38 miles from Sacramento, the Central Pacific has no option but to cut straight through the rock. They will need to chisel and blast a passage called the Bloomer Cut. A daunting engineering feat, 63 feet deep and 800 feet long. Even though they are small, the Chinese workers prove themselves extremely capable. Railroad Superintendent Strobridge quickly hires more. The working conditions on the railroad were difficult. They were driven. They didn't get days off. What are they going to take a day off for? And as long as the weather held, they would work. They would work even sometimes in blizzard conditions. It would take them a year to complete Bloomer Cut and the equally impressive Fort Point Cut, some 70 feet deep and 600 feet long. The mountains ahead and the Central Pacific needs thousands more workers. There is only one solution. Recruit more workers from China. And they went to the same area where the Chinese initially came from for the gold rush. And that is the, the Guangdong region of China. Among them is Connie's great-grandfather, Li Wong Sang, who is quickly promoted to labor boss. He knew how to read and write English. I, I see his signature. I've seen his signature on documents. And he became an interpreter. He became an agent or a foreman. As soon as somebody's hired on the railroad, you know, their skills are assessed. And, and if anybody who who was a leader of men or, or could speak English and Chinese. I mean, that's very special. Soon, thousands of Chinese are working on the western stretch of the Transcontinental Railroad. On October 10, 1865, Central Pacific Railroad Baron Leland Stanford testifies to the U.S. Congress. The greater portion of the laborers employed by us are Chinese, who constitute a large element of the population of California. Without them, it's impossible to complete the western portion of this great national enterprise. Meanwhile, in the east, the Union Pacific Railroad is making rapid progress. Easy access to workers and supplies gives them a huge advantage over the Central Pacific. Supplies for the underdeveloped West must be transported across hundreds of miles of rugged country or shipped around South America's treacherous Cape Horn. Iron rails, spikes, blasting powder, the locomotives, even the picks and shovels. 
before the railroad connected the east to California, California might have been in a different hemisphere. If you left New York City in 1860 and attempted to get to Sacramento overland, it took an average of 166 days. So if you made it. By land or sea, it is a long and expensive journey, causing many delays. A steady stream of provisions is required to keep the thousands of workers going. Supply trains transport tons of materials to work sites further and further up the mountain. In spring of 1866, the Central Pacific Eight feet across. As they continue to push up the mountain, each mile seems slower than the last. One steep precipice is dubbed Cape Horn after the treacherous seas at the tip of South America. Here, the only option is to carve into the side of the mountain. On sheer cliffs above the American River, Chinese workers are said to have been lowered in baskets to set explosive charges. The Chinese would be lowered in baskets from the top of the mountain, and they would pound away with their picks to put holes in the rock so they could put in blasting powder or TNT. And they would put it in there, and then they had to light the fuse and then swing out of the way before the explosive charge went off. Most of the time, they did get out of the way. Not always. The days are long and grueling, but one day a week, the workers are given a break. Chinese live in separate camps from the Anglos and steadfastly adhere to the customs and traditions of their homeland. Unlike the Irish, they have to supply their own food, but this proves key to their good health. They'll water for tea, grow fresh vegetables, and seed ponds with catfish along the railroad. Like Healthy but lonely, the men often pass their time gambling. They play their wages, hoping to win a little extra to send home. But some are not so lucky. Occasionally, letters arrive from family. My son, you have been away from home for years. During that time, your second elder brother died. Then your father died. I may already be gone by the time you come back. Would you feel sorry then? I could not keep the tears from running down my cheeks when thinking back to the time of our separation. 
China seems a distant memory. Will they ever see their families again? It's been nearly three years since the groundbreaking of the Transcontinental Railroad, and the pressure to finish intensifies. The Union Pacific hires masses of Irish immigrants in the east, and the Central Pacific recruits thousands of workers from China. By 1866, the Union Pacific Railway is clearly winning the race. They have already laid over 500 miles of rail, and government officials praise them as a pioneer of civilization. In the West, progress is impossibly slow. It has taken two years to complete just 70 miles. They are barely halfway to the top. By now, about 90% of the Central Pacific Railroad workers are Chinese. Some say as many as 15,000. The work is increasingly treacherous. The higher the elevation, the harder the rock. There is only one way through explosives. By 1867, workers are using 250 to 300 kegs of black powder daily. Ahead, the railway will have to climb another 3,500 feet in elevation. It will require blasting out 15 tunnels up and over Donner Summit. A staggering feat of engineering and hard labor. The toughest conquest will be Tunnel 6 at the very top. 1,700 feet of solid granite. Donner Summit historian Bill Udegist explains how it was done. These boreholes were done by teams of three Chinese workers. Two of them had sledge hammers, seven and a half pound sledges, and they would hit a flat drill bit. And every time they hit the drill bit, the person holding the bit would rotate it a quarter of a turn. So once something like bam, bam, quarter turn, bam, bam, quarter turn, and they did that all day long. It would take workers eight to 10 hours to drill just three boreholes. After each blast, workers remove the rock debris and begin again. The challenges were, were enormous because they, they had to carve by hand tools, by hand, chisel the granite rock. These were winters, two winters that they, it took them, were the worst winters ever recorded. In 1866, there were 44 snowstorms, ranging from short ones that lasted only a day to one that lasted almost a week and dumping almost 10 feet of snow at one time. That winter, almost 60 feet of snow fell. Li Wang Sang, like all, most of the Chinese workers of that time, the 1860s, came from a, pr uh, a province called Toisan. It was very warm and humid almost all the time. To go from that kind of almost tropical climate to the Sierras, which is, is cold most of the time, imagine it during the winter. <laughs> 
avalanches occurred frequently and without warning. The Chinese were in constant fear that their avalanches would come roaring down the mountains. On one occasion, there is a report shot were working up there and they saw an avalanche coming down the hill. So seeing a big rock, they stepped behind it to get out of the way of the avalanche. And the next spring, their bodies were discovered still holding their shovels in their hands. Tunnel 6 progresses only inches a day, despite shifts of workers toiling round the clock. To speed things up, Central Pacific's railroad barons ordered aft board into the middle of the tunnel. They decided they had to go even faster, and they could double it if they built a shaft down through the center here, 90 feet through granite down. Then they could build from the inside out as well as from the outside in. And even with three crews on each face, working four faces at a time, 12 crews, in eight-hour shifts, 24 hours a day, they only made 14 inches of progress per day. Keeping so many crews working day in and day out required a steady flow of supplies. The end of track was at Cisco, about 10 miles west of here were thousands of people living there. And every day at the height, something like 87 train car loads were unloaded, put onto wagons to be taken up the Dutch Flat Wagon Road to service the railroad building here and further east. Desperate to finish Tunnel 6, Central Pacific decides to risk a new blasting explosive, one that is many times more powerful and more deadly, nitroglycerin. It proves so unstable that California bans its transport. To get around this, the railroad hires a chemist to make it on site. It's a dangerous, volatile substance. Even handled with great care, there are accidents. It's 13 times more powerful. We can go faster. So they brought in the nitroglycerin, and that's when many of the Chinese railroad workers died because it was so delicate. And just the movement of the wind would, would explode the dynamite in their hands. extremely dangerous. Not only did you have these explosives ready to go off, but it was very dark and they couldn't see. And the air was full of rock dust and black powder dust. It almost doubles the progress but with deadly results. No one knows how many Chinese die, likely as many as one in 10. One of the things that uh, my great grandfather was very aware of was that if he died working on the railroad, his bones would be sent back to his village. And they all knew that. If they died, they, 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 that was very important that they would be buried in their home village. And their, their relatives certainly would know what happened to them. Tigasungo 
还没有政府的各种各样的资助，保证安全的工作条件，所以你死掉之后就没有任何的资助，资助，这是一个相当那个不人道的那个情况。From the outset, Chinese workers were paid less than the Irish, working longer shifts, and were given the most dangerous jobs. On June 25th, 1867, Chinese workers do the unthinkable. They go on strike. Superintendent Strobridge orders them to return to work, but they refuse. Several days go by, and the Chinese continue to demand higher wages and better conditions. The railroad barons respond by cutting off their food supply. In the isolated Sierras, the workers had little choice, starve or go back to work. They return, once again laboring from dawn to dusk. Finally, two months later, in August 1867, weary workers break through the last few inches of Tunnel 6. With their ingenuity, strength, and willingness to endure, they have conquered the Sierras. The celebration is short-lived. Ahead stretches hundreds of miles of track still to lay. By early 1869, transcontinental railroad crews are flying toward the finish. The Union Pacific Railroad Barons bet the Central Pacific that they will get to Promontory Summit first. There was an actual bet that had been made uh, between the dignitaries of who could lay the most miles of track in one day. The Union Pacific dignitary said, there's no way you could beat it. If you do, we'll pay you $10,000. The Central Pacific wins the bet. Chinese workers do the impossible, laying 10 miles and 56 feet of track in just one day. On May 10, 1869, the Union Pacific's number 119 and the Central Pacific's Jupiter locomotives come together at Promontory. In a ceremony that is telegraphed worldwide, the final spike is driven. For the first time in history, a railroad spans the entire country. It will now be possible to cross the continent in less than two weeks. A famous photo celebrates the completion of the historic transcontinental railroad. But the thousands of Chinese who contributed are not represented. Take a look at the famous photograph of the two trains meeting. There are no Chinese in the photograph.
others hope to return home to China, but the journey back to San Francisco is nearly 800 miles long, much of it across Nevada's hot desert. Others, like Andrea Yi's great grandfather, Lim Hip Hong, strike out for new adventures. He heads to the notorious mining town of Virginia City, Nevada. There, he adopts the ways of the Wild West. He was very popular and very known to be a Chinese cowboy with um, boots, spurs, leather pants, a white horse, and a hat. And uh, he, he loved to go to a bar called Bucket of Blood. And it's still standing there. <laughs> He probably was very, very fun-loving, a leader of uh, the rascals. He loved America because it was a free land. Wherever there is a frontier town, from Virginia City to legendary Deadwood, there is a Chinatown. Along with cowboys, outlaws like Jesse James and lawmen like Wyatt Earp, there are Chinese restaurants, boarding houses, laundries, prostitutes, opium dens, and even volunteer Chinese fire departments. The number of Chinese in the Old West continues to grow, lured from their homeland by stories of opportunity and prosperity. <laughs> They had come to Gold Mountain to make their fortune and return to China. But by the 1870s, there is a significant shift. Chinese sojourners are now becoming settlers. They envision staying in the New World for a few years and then uh, returning, which many of them did. But many others also stayed here in the United States and became the uh, ancestors of many of today's uh, Chinese Americans. Where one opportunity fades, another seems to emerge especially in California. California was this great big place with lots of land and, and lots of work was needed to make it habitable. So Chinese laborers took whatever work they could. By the 1870s, the census tells us that almost 25% of the population of California was Chinese. After the Transcontinental Railroad, thousands find work east of San Francisco in an area remarkably similar to China's Guangdong Delta. They would build the Sacramento River levees that put California agriculture on the map. 150 years ago, this whole area was, was swamps. And in the effort to turn it into some of the richest farmland in America, uh, Chinese workers were brought in to build the levees, plant the first crops that actually made this into an important farming area. Darren Owing knows this area well. He is the great-grandson of one of the first Chinese who settled here. My dad and, and my grandparents and my great-grandparents all lived in this, in this area. And so we consider it sort of like our, our old village, in, in a sense. 
Darren's grandfather and father were born in nearby Cortland, at its height, home to several thousand Chinese. By the late 1800s, nearly 90% of the Delta farm workers were Chinese. They tilled the farmlands that today bring in over $500 million a year. The historical town of Locke evokes a distant past. You look around now, it looks pretty quiet, pretty small, just about a block long. On the weekdays, there'd be maybe about 600 people living here. But on the weekends, everybody would come here to socialize, to gamble, to see friends. Uh, and so this town really was the central hub for all the Chinese working within uh, dozens of miles of here. Ties to China are strong, and traditional Chinese culture thrives. Darren's grandfather is among the crowd pleasers. My grandfather was a Chinese opera star, and so he performed here in this town, but also in, in Chinese communities all up and down the West Coast. I don't think of Chinese culture uh, as being foreign. I think of Chinese culture as being part of the fabric of America. They would continue to strengthen their communities and weave Chinese culture into the tapestry of America. By the late 1870s, over a quarter of the population of San Francisco is Chinese. It has the largest Chinatown outside of China. Opportunity abounds, particularly for the merchant class. Manufacturing and trade are expanding rapidly thanks to the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. The immediate impact of the Transcontinental Railroad was that it opened California to enterprise, to travel, to communication from the rest of the country. Physically and technologically, the railroad made the entire continental United States a single market. But as San Francisco grows, so do its problems, especially in the densely populated Chinatown. Tension is growing. In 1873, a severe economic downturn triggers intense competition for jobs. It incites a wave of anti-Chinese sentiment across the country. Irish and other white workers see the Chinese as the cause for their economic woes. And politicians play on their fears. The violence worsens, and Chinese are driven from their homes. The U.S. Congress passes an Exclusion Act and other racist laws. Chinese will have to fight for their right to stay in America. Andrea Yi's great-grandparents are among the few to forge a family life during these dark days. They would meet by chance in Chinatown, a young servant girl and railroad worker, adventurer, cowboy, Lim Hip Hong. He was on his way back to San Francisco to dock on a boat and go back because his mother wanted him to get married and then he ran into this beautiful young Chinese girl. Together, they will struggle. This is the first time of the history of the 
workers who are in no small measure responsible for one of the largest economic expansions in our country and really one of the most significant historic accomplishments. My hope is that by sharing the history of these workers, we can help to repay some of the debt we owe to generations of immigrants who helped build this country. I'm very proud my great-grandfather was one of them. One hundred and fifty years ago, Chinese would seek their fortune on Gold Mountain. Today, their descendants symbolize an extraordinary history of struggle and triumph. One that will never again be forgotten.